This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Jessica Hammer, co-host of Crowned and Dangerous here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you are done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Crowned and Dangerous, where Maddie and I talk about all things pageant-related, especially our experiences in the Miss America organization. A new show comes out bi-weekly, every other Thursday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Crowned and Dangerous. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House House Media. Throughout history, the course of sports has been shaped by one thing, the fans. From the moments you never dreamed of. To the moments that still give you nightmares. Behind the band. Super Bowl! Brady has his fifth! Through the good and the bad, fans have helped change the games we watch and the players we love. They may not be the most logical people. You are a factory of sadness! I'll see you Sunday. But they know their teams better than anybody. They'll blow in the ninth. You may not always see them, but you know where to find them. After all, there's nothing quite like the view from the cheap seats. Broadcasting as part of the Public House Media Network. Grab a chair and enjoy all there is in The the Cheap cheap seats. Seats. We're back with you on this Wednesday morning. Welcome back into the Cheap Seats. Thank you again for tuning in to us today. I'm Max Walpuff. Christian Heimel is with me this week. And Christian, there's plenty to go around in this September. It's not time to go to sleep and just wake up when it's back time for October. <laughs> there is a lot going on this month. And you know something? I think that I think this might be an underrated month for sports. See, I, I think it's like the second best month for sports. Or like or maybe the third. It's definitely in the top three because outside of like, you know, the like April where you've got baseball and March Madness closing out. And you've got you know the race for the playoffs in basketball and 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 uh, hockey. This is you've got everything. You got pennant race for baseball. You've got college football. You got the NFL starting up. Like this is a really good month. And with the NFL starting up, we do have to open with this: the defending Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles. Boy, is that going to feel weird to say? They <laughs> open for they open for the NFL on Thursday night tomorrow against the Atlanta Falcons. Now. Mm-hmm. If you've been paying it all at all attention to the Eagles media this week, it has been who's going to start week one and Philadelphia head coach Doug Peterson would not announce this until they were ready and they were finally ready just today ago, just a few days ago when they announced Nick Foles, the Super Bowl winning quarterback will indeed start week one because Carson Wentz is not ready from his knee injury from last season. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I don't think it's a surprise. I think people, you know, th- this is one of those things. We as journalists, we decide that, you know, we want information. We want a narrative. We want something to write about. And instead of going and finding maybe, you know, that great story about the 53rd guy who made it past the cuts or, you know, this this veteran who is taking less money, whatever it may be, we always go for the the biggest question mark, I guess, quote unquote, which is who's going to be the starting quarterback. There was the same thing that happened in Alabama. And and look what happened to Maria Taylor and and um you know what Nick Saban did, uh and how he's handled all of this. So like I mean it's it's not surprising at all that this finally came out that it's going to be Nick Foles because Carson Wentz. We've known this since the injury. Like if you just look at the medical timeline, Carson Wentz was not going to be ready for Week One. So it's just it's just one of those things that we as journalists we just pepper and pester these head coaches until they can't take it anymore. Yeah, and that injury was back in December, if I remember correctly, and if Google tells Probably. Yep. So the recovery timeline is at six to nine months. So this is the nine month time. So this, and with a guy who's in his second year, you do not want to rush him back, oh. especially your your franchise quarterback. You don't want to rush him and back. Besides, Philadelphia, you already won the Super Bowl. <laughs> you won one. Take it from a Capitals yep. fan. Enjoy this. Yep. 
But I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. Like, I mean, I, I can't say I'm surprised at all. Uh, uh, again, that is Nick Foles. I can't say I'm surprised that Doug Peterson was a little annoyed uh, at how many people were asking about it. But I, I mean, I can honestly say that like, it's, it's not, it's not something surprising at all. Like if you were really and honestly looking at uh, this whole lead up into it, I wouldn't be surprised if Carson went since out multiple weeks. I wouldn't be surprised if you don't see him until week four. Just just to be safe, because he is the future of your franchise, and there's no need to rush him back. You don't need to rush him back because you already won the darn Super Bowl. <laughs> you have one is not you have your championship. What does Tom Brady always say? That the the best one is the next one. That's what he, like that's his favorite one is the next one. Like there's there's never enough. Come on, you know this. I, you know what? I guess I've just accepted that my team is only going to win one championship in my lifetime, and I'm very okay with that. <laughs> Anyhow, we need to get something a little off the field football related. Nike has announced yeah. that they are going to be using Colin Kaepernick, former NFL quarterback and current NFL league agitator. As their face of the new campaign that they have for their 30th anniversary, if, if one of the one of the big calling cards of this is the "believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything" slogan. Yeah, so th- this was part of the, as you said, the 30th anniversary of their "Just Do It" campaign, and, and this might have been the best kept secret I've seen in advertising. This this was like all of a sudden on Monday afternoon it drops. And Twitter lit up. It was it was incredible to see. Now I, I'm going to say this first and foremost. I love the campaign. I love the idea behind it. I'm glad it's Colin Kaepernick. I'm glad Nike is going that route. I think it's tremendously powerful for them, not just from a branding standpoint, but from a social standpoint. And and I, I mean I think it's awesome. And it's just one of those things that like you look at it and it's really kind of. Um, like I said, it's just powerful in general. I mean, it's, 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 I think it's great that this is how they do it. I think it's amazing how it happened. Um, but like I said, just out of nowhere, it, it felt like on Monday, this just dropped and, and, you know, it just really kind of took people surprise, uh, took people aback. I think in the world of advertising, it's a, it's a thing of loose lips sink ships and everybody has a sunken ship at this point. Everyone right. talks in the world of PR, advertising. There are scheduled leaks, planned leaks, unplanned leaks. This is a tough industry to keep a secret in. And Nike not mm. only managed to pay Colin Kaepernick for the entire time this was under wraps, they, right. they managed to keep this totally secretive, and then they were the ones that did the announcement. Not some out-of-the-way blog, not Deadspin, not TMZ, not ESPN, not any of the big outlets they were the ones that did it and as an advertiser that is a holy grail achievement yep it's uh, it's it's unbelievable like and and look there are people there are of course the morons who are out there um and i'm putting that term loosely uh and and i'm really kind of saving it for another term that i like i'd prefer to use but you know we 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 try to be kid friendly here yeah family show exactly uh who are cutting the nike swoosh off of their uh, Nike gear after this because they don't like what Colin Kaepernick represents to them. But the campaign, I think, is is a lot more like just do it to me has always been about stop making excuses, stop finding a reason not to, and just go and do it. And that's what this Colin, that's what Kaepernick's thing has been. Believe in something, even if it means sacrificing everything. Don't find a reason not to do it. Just go out and do it. It's the same stance as if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. That's exactly what this all is. It's not just, you know, and people are going to take it into context. And of course, it's hard not to. And I don't think it's wrong to take it into the context of the fact that the guy who's part of this, Colin Kaepernick, is the one who was the face of the anthem demonstration in the NFL. So they're going to take it to that and they're going to start saying that Nike's, you know, anti flag or anti military, which is that part is wrong as a serious jump to make. But it's not a terrible message to be putting out there. Now, I I have enjoyed seeing on Facebook and Twitter the memes of this campaign. One of I didn't know there were ones already, but then again, I shouldn't be surprised. You haven't seen the Thanos Nike ad? No. Oh my god! Basically, someone took a Photoshop, took Kaepernick's face out, and put Thanos from Oh my god Infinity War in because he stood for something, sacrificed everything. So think about that. 
Oh, man. I have been enjoying everything online about these memes. I mean, I haven't been enjoying the comments section because I'm an idiot and I have to read the comments sometimes. But I have been enjoying the photoshops people have made. I really do applaud the internet for going full Thanos treatment on that. That was a wonderful photoshop. All due respect to the 72 Dolphins and every college team that's ever done it, but there are only two people who are undefeated, and that's father time and the internet. The internet is undefeated. So, <laughs> Oh, boy. Now, let's go to golf, because the golf season is just about to wrap up, and I understand a few of you are rolling your eyes at, oh, we ought to talk about golf now. <laughs> but don't worry. We're almost done. TPC Boston just wrapped up, and Bryson DeChambeau, one of my favorite golf names, Won the Dell Technologies Championship. Is he your favorite because he not only his name not only sounds like some English dude, but he kind of dresses like one with that little what? Not even like a fedora thing. I don't even know what that's it's called. Kind of like an Irish golf hat. Yeah. But I, I see a picture of it. Yeah, in the article that we have in the rundown. But to see like the golf season's just about to end, and the FedEx Cup. I mean, it is. It's basically over. It, basically. Yes. He's got, what, two more events in the FedEx Cup playoffs, and he's already locked up the number one spot, so he's already locked up the FedEx Cup championship. Yeah, this is pretty close. It's right about, it's almost guaranteed at this point. So yeah, yeah. this is the first time since the Cup was created that, some, that one person has won the first two legs since VJ Singh in 2008. That was 10 years ago. And I believe that was the first yep, year. You might still remember VJ Singh. Where do I know that <laughs> name from? <laughs> I remember VJ Singh actually quite quite well because that very first year of the FedEx Cup, I actually covered the um, the opening event uh, at Liberty National Golf Course in New Jersey, and I got to go to Media Day, and VJ was the featured golfer. So I do remember VJ quite well, actually. <laughs> well, I still remember VJ Singh as one of those challengers to Tiger ten years ago. Yeah, there were a lot of those, oh, though. Oh, I know. It was Tiger Woods, a few challengers, and then 50 feet of crap, and then there's everybody else. And there's everybody else. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you, Billy Bean. I appreciate yep. that. That is, again, one of those famous movie lines that has just entered the public lexicon, and I'm so As it should. So, but here's, so here, here's the best part about this. So... So when yeah when he gets to the tour the, the, yeah it, it's not it's not guaranteed that Bryson DeChambeau has won the FedEx Cup but what it is guaranteed is he's the number one seed heading into the Tour Championship, um, which is the final event of the FedEx Cup playoffs. What's great about this is that this guy, a, a lot of he's been inconsistent up until the last three month two months really where he's now won three tournaments in his last nine starts. After you know, a lot of people thought he was going to be the next um, Jordan Spieth, the next Rory McIlroy, and he really kind of struggled during the summer. But he's really turned things on here uh, in the last seven, eight events that he's played. And golf still is looking for a replacement star because we still have Tiger Watch every Sunday. Yeah. And, and guys like Rory and Jordan and Justin Thomas and, and all those others have, have really kind of struggled. I mean, yeah, we're waiting for, um, oh my goodness, uh, John Rahm might be one of those guys we're hoping for. There's there's a number of guys that everybody's just waiting to see who it's going to be. And this guy who people call the mad scientist because of how talented he is for his, um, you know, and, and just how he works on like, literally uses like math and geometry during the round. Like that's just weird. Like people don't think about that. Like he works on biomechanics for calculations that go into every single shot. I don't know if biomechanics has ever been used to describe golf ever. Well, it makes sense in the abstract. It does very much so very much so. But this guy, he literally uses like single length clubs. Like he doesn't use like for, for, for golfers, you can use like uh, a seven iron is just about 34 inches. But you can always add to it based off your height, based off your swing, and things like that. You can add to your grip. Nope, he just keeps it as as basically factory made. He keeps it standard off the the conveyor belt. That's how he he works and doesn't use it, yet somehow competes without using the technology that's available to him. The last point I want to make on this: Do you ever watch the movie Goon? Yes. Okay. There's that. One, <laughs> it's been a that while, one but yeah. Dude on the team that ha that studies math and 
understands hockey by all angles and speed, velocity, force. Yeah. Yeah. It's looked upon kind of weird in sports when you put it like this, but that's what a lot of it is. It's not a whole lot of luck yeah. involved. Sometimes you get luck with placement, but with golf, you're in a large amount of control over where you place the ball. Yep. <laughs> you're not and, wrong. And, and then no. there's me on the golf course who slices and curves everything because I stink, but that's not important. That's all right. It's all right. I've been playing for 21 years. I still stink. It's okay. That's okay. Let's move on. We've got a little bit of a break coming up. We've got a lengthy discussion about the September call-ups. It's about time where your favorite Major League Baseball team is calling up a bunch of guys, and you're like Patrick walking back to his house with eyeballs on the ground. Who are you people? (laughs) We're going to go into the September call-up rule, why it's there, reasons it should stay. Should it be expanded to the whole season? Should it be getting rid of entirely? We'll talk about all that when we come back on the Cheap Seats Powered by Squadcast. Hi, this is Emily. This is Lindsay. And this is Elizabeth. Co-hosts of Beauties and Headcanons here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you are done with this episode, we hope you'll come check out our show, Beauties and Headcanons, where we talk nerdy to you about fandoms, fan fiction, and all pop culture for nerds that you can think of. A new show comes out every Friday. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of Beauties and Headcanons. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Kim Meyer, the host of Choose to Rise here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Choose to Rise, where we talk about living with positive mindsets, how to increase our confidence, building our faith, and living out our life on purpose. A new show comes out via podcast every Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And if you want to catch the episode live instead, stop by Public House Media around 645 Central Standard Time, Monday, Wednesday, Friday as well. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Choose to Rise. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. Everybody get up. And we're back on the cheap seats on this Wednesday. Max Walpup with Christian Heimel. We just wrapped up some talk about golf, about the NFL, about Colin Kaepernick. And to wrap up our football talk, we do have a pigskin pick'em league brought to you on Public House Media. You can go to our Facebook page to join. You can go to our Facebook page to pick your best and see how you do on Sunday and Monday. Because right now, this is the hot new thing to do. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just something fun. Like, we did this back in March with our bracket challenge uh, for the Cheap Seats, uh, or Public House Media's bracket challenge presented by the Cheap Seats. So it's it's the same thing. It's Public House Pick'em presented by the Cheap Seats. Um, it's a free league. It is a public league. But I should note, it is a straight Pick'em league. So there are three different types of Pick'em. There's the spread, uh, which, I mean... I, I don't want to do spread picks unless I'm betting because I feel like it's like, what's the point? <laughs> and then there's confidence pick which, you know, you you have like six, you have a point total and you assign a point total at each game based on how confident you are that team will win. We're just going to do straight pick them. Anybody can join. So jump on in one entry per person. We are going to have weekly winners and we will have overall winners. So if you don't make it this week, that's okay. That's fine. You can always do week two all the way up to week 17. So head to our Facebook page, Cheap Seats by Public House Media and join our pigskin pick'em league. Now, what you just explained to me barely made any sense. That's fine. It's because I'm a degenerate. I understand completely. Now, (laughs) baseball is approaching its final month, and currently the the, uh, A-gate in the newspaper is filling up with a bunch of minor league names. Minor league season, for most teams, is over, and it's time for everybody on a major league contract to see if they have won the lucky lottery to go to major league baseball for a month. This mm-hmm. is this is the roster expansion rule. There are 25 men on a typical major league baseball roster at any given time. Most of them are pitchers. We have a rule in September though that once the minor league season's over, the major league roster expands to 40. Up to, yep, up to. You don't have to go to 40. You can be at like 27. You're right. You can only, you can go to 30. You can also go to 40. You can go to 38. How about 39? I I, I like, I like the number 27. I like that number. (laughs) But the reason, part of the reason this rule exists is basically to just give another month of baseball to minor league players and to just give them a chance 
to show what they have at the major league level. And for some teams that are completely out of playoff contention, I look at teams like Kansas City, Baltimore, other teams in the cellar. They have a chance to showcase their their future talents in a limited pressure environment. Uh, yeah, I mean, so it, it, it is twofold. It is number one. It's basically like, you know, reverse spring training. It's like, uh, you know, spring training at the end of the year where you can see what you might have for next season. Maybe there's a minor leaguer who you're not sure if you want to extend an offer to to resign him, but you bring him up. He's had a good year. Uh, it's to reward some of these players who have had good years in the minors because it does usually end on Labor Day. That is except for playoffs um, that does, um, you know, that do go past that. Uh, but at the same time, it's also for these teams because you're in the final month of the season and you're looking for maybe you're trying to give like, like the Boston Red Sox, for example, they're trying to, they've got such a big lead in the East and in the wild card that with Chris sale and David price, uh, uh, a little bit on, you know, a little bit banged up, they can now go down to the minors and they can grab four or five other pitchers and use those guys instead of trying to rush back their starters and their aces for the playoffs. So it does kind of serve two purposes, but I'm going to tell you right now, I hate the 40 man rot. I hate it so much. I really, really do it. Especially in September, it bothers me. It just does like, I mean, okay. Context here. So this, this is the whole history of, of the 25 man roster. So the 25 man roster was officially created first in 1920. Before that, it was, you know, you could range rosters generally were 16 to 21 people. Um, but the 25 man limit max was only in effect from May 15th to September 1st. So you could keep as many people as you want up until the 15th. And then you had to cut it down to 25 for the first basically month of the season. And then in September, it would again expand. Um, they dropped that rule in 1968. So since 1968, the rule that we have had currently in place has been around. The game has changed so much with specializations, lefty specialists, um, you know, like it, it. And when you bring in seven or eight other pitchers, because that's all you're bringing and you're not bringing in that much bench help. Sure, some teams are um, like the Red Sox, again, who yesterday brought up Rafael Devers and Brandon Phillips into the infield. Potentially, you're going to bring Dustin Pedroia back. Like you're going to have more guys on the infield than you have in the bullpen, potentially for the Red Sox. But it's. It just it, it delays the game so much more, and and I know that the numbers aren't like dra- like when I say so much more, I'm really honestly only talking like ninety seconds to three minutes, based off all the pitching changes that you make. But I don't know if it's necessarily a fair competitive competitive balance because all of a sudden you've got guys that you've never had to pitch to or guys you've never had to hit against, and like for instance, you mentioned those teams in the cellar. Like when the Nationals play the Braves, for instance, the Nationals are done, gone. But the Braves are going to have to face guys that they have zero scouting report on when they're in the midst of a wild card of of a pennant race. And those games could decide the pennant based off kids who have no reason being in the majors right now for a team that has no business ruining and adjusting how the standings look. Now, I understand there are a couple of baseball fanatics that are going to be crying, but wait a second, there is a 40-man roster. Just look at AAA. You're right, and that's where the September 1st rule becomes an interesting one because Major League Baseball baseball teams are allowed to carry 40 contracts they can bring up from the minor leagues pretty easily. That's where the option and outright becomes an interesting one because when you send someone down to AAA and you keep them on the 40-man roster, you're taking an option. If you send someone down to AAA and you send them there outright, you take them off the 40-man roster. And this is part of where my argument rests. It's a huge payday for everybody in minor league baseball. Mm -hmm. The payday for minor league baseball players is comparatively to a minimum wage job, pretty much nothing. These guys do not make a whole lot of money. Like They're making, in a ballpark sense, they're kind of making peanuts. Yeah, I mean, and, and listen, I've, I've worked in minor league baseball for, oh, geez, almost seven years now. Um, and, and yes, I mean, it's it's really unfortunate. You know, most of these players legitimately are getting paid at most, if they're lucky, $6,000 a year. That's 
no. because they're only getting paid during the months that they're actually pitching or they're during the months that they're actually playing. They're not getting paid like, you know, a J.D. Martinez, a John Carlos Stanton, a Max Scherzer. They're not getting paid in December. You know, they're only getting paid from opening day in the, in the minors, which is like April 5th to the end of their season. That's it. They're getting paid those five months. So if you're most minor league contracts are a minimum of 1100 bucks. So that's $5,500 for the summer that you're getting paid. That's nothing. Not easy living. It's not. But I, I don't know if that's reason enough for the 40 man roster. Like, I, I get it. I, should minor league teams have more money for, to pay their players? Yes. That I believe 100%. But at the same time, if you start, uh, there's no reason whatsoever that you should be paying minor leaguers close to what major leaguers are getting. There's no reason for that whatsoever. I, I used to believe wholeheartedly if you've got a, a minor leaguer, like if you've got Matt Holiday sitting there in AAA for the Rockies, he should be getting paid his you know $1.3 million, even though he's going to sit in AAA for the entire year. I don't believe that at all because then what are you telling a guy like Jesus Sheffield a guy like Juan Soto, who, you know, oh, you want to be in the major leagues? Well, I'll give you $1.1 million to stay in AAA, or I'll pay you, you know, $3,000 a month for four months out of the year, and you got to bust your tail and get better to make the major leagues. There's an incentive to make the major leagues, not just to be called a major leaguer, but for that payday as well for these minor leaguers. So they should get paid more, but there's no reason why we should be paying them even close to what the, the, regular 25 man major leaguers are getting paid and to dismantle the dismantle the pay system that minor league baseball is built on would pretty much dismantle a lot of major league baseball's business structure with regard oh, yeah. to the minor league so there's a whole can of worms that you could open saying that minor league baseball players should at least make a living wage where there's a lot of unanswered questions there and we're not going to get into that yeah, and, and and I'll just say this, you know, as as someone who runs a a independent league team, we're not affiliated, but I can tell you right now that the monetary teams are not making money off of players. You know, they're not. Um, but at the same time, most of these players, this is where host families become so important in the minor leagues. And if you ever get a chance to seriously, do me a favor, please. Go on to the internet, go to Google and search for the nearest minor league team or college league team that you have and be a host family. It really is a great experience and it really is something that helps not only those young players and those kids, but it helps the team out tremendously. You'll enjoy it. If you have kids, they will enjoy it so much because they'll get to go and they'll get to say that they got, had to, you know, got to be friends or, you know, became brothers to a, um, a, a professional baseball player. It's a great thing. And, but then secondly, that's something that I have experienced. Like a lot of them, a lot of these a guys, broadcaster for a college level team. Like I talked to basically right. everybody on the roster about their host parents. They love them. They love them exactly because, they, because they're treated so well by a lot of these families. That's part of the reason they stay in the sport. Anthony Rizzo, Anthony Rizzo flew his host family from single A, his very first year in the Cubs organization, flew his host family to Chicago for the World Series in 2016. I mean that's like that's that's how these players feel. Like that's it's a valuable so, experience for a lot of these guys to have their living situation taken care of, have some of their home life in some measure of order. Like I reading a right. uh, reading Pedro Martinez's autobiography when he was in the Mountain West League getting adjusted to America for the first time, his host he leaned on his host family a lot. Teach oh, yeah. him about America oh, yeah. to teach him about English to understand what it was what life was like in middle of nothing Wyoming. <laughs> yeah, and, and and not only that, so but I mean, not only the host family, like that's not, but like some of these players, a lot of these players run camps back home. A lot of them are like you know coaches elsewhere. They do clinics. They run camps. So it's not as if this is their only form of income. They have other ways to do it. Sure, are some of them like. Like I have a friend of mine who pitches, um, who used to pitch for the Diamondbacks organization. This dude like works on Wall Street in the off season. Like, like he's he's insanely smart. He's got a double major in finance and economics. Sounds like a pretty cool but he just gig. loves. 
Yeah, but he just loves he loves pitching. He loves baseball. I have friends who are real estate agents who are contractors. That's what they do in the off season. Uh, but they play baseball because they love it. And a lot of it is because sometimes of that host family. So, you know, it, it, I understand that minor leaguers, it's a tough living. But I'll tell you right now, so is working in minor league baseball. <laughs> it's it, when it's a, when it's a full time job, it's not exactly glamorous either. So don't don't think that just because like, for instance, like a broadcaster you know, or a uh, or, or a sales rep at a minor league team who's making is making, you know, loads of money they're making if they're lucky 23,000 for the entire year they're making when you expand it out there they're making probably just as much uh as if not a little bit more as the players that are on the roster so all right i got a trivia question for you christian now that we're off the host family subject all right so a trade is made in september what happens because you you are allowed to make trades in september I have no idea. All right. So the reason I bring this up, you can have a player traded to another team in September. That player just can't be eligible for the postseason. Right, right. That, that's something I consistently need to remind myself of because baseball is littered with rules that I don't understand. Baseball's trade rules are stupid. That is, that is also true, but I'm not going to get into that. Like, I mean, the waiver deadline should be like literally two, like it should be August 15th, not August 31st. It's two weeks after the actual non-waiver trade deadline. And then after that, no more trades. It's a deadline. No mas. Uh, That's another argument that we can have like for seven hours. Yeah, I know. We could, we could go through this, but then that would also tune out a lot of people with the too much inside baseball. Yes. Yes. We'd get way into the nitty gritty. All right. So with postseason rosters, I still remember 2013. Do you remember when the Red Sox had a pinch runner by the name of Quinton Berry? I love Quinton Berry. So I love Quinton Berry. He was. He just got signed. Uh, out, I don't know. I think the Padres just picked him up out of the Atlantic League. I think. I can't I'm remember. I'm going to look that up right now just to be totally sure. Um, Currently, he's with the. No, that's 2017. Brewers last yeah, Brewers year. last year. I'm not finding any of his minor league stuff. Uh, let's see here. I will find something. I'll find something for him. I'm Don't sure. worry. We should probably take a break so I can I can I can be smart here. Oh, the Yankees just. Picked uh, do him you up. do you want to take a break? Nope. I did. Well, we can we should take a break, but I just found it. He just. Uh, yep. He uh, just got signed by the Yankees. Oh, he's in their great. minor league system now. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Another outfielder. Another outfielder <laughs> for New York, yes. We're going to go to positionless baseball now. We're going to have outfielders everywhere, maybe a pitcher, maybe a catcher. That's about it. Now, everyone's an outfielder now. Basically, yep. Positionless baseball. Oh, boy, that's a that's a whole other thought experiment right there. Why don't we take a quick break? We'll come back with a second portion of this argument. Remember, we're here on the Cheap Seats presented by Squadcast. You can go to our store if you want to support our our, our uh, show. The Cheap Seats store. You can buy t-shirts, mugs, hats, knit caps. I understand it's coming around to winter. They make great Christmas gifts, by the way. Yes, they yes, do. Our poll question will answer a little bit more. Should Major League Baseball still allow more players on rosters in September, it's the 25 versus the 40 man roster. We'll be right back with the second portion of this on the cheap seats. How's it going, everybody? This is Keith and Katie, host of Coffee with Keith and Katie here on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. When you're done here, I hope you'll check out our show, Coffee with Keith and Katie, where we talk about our lives and relationship over a cup of coffee. A new episode airs on Facebook Live every Monday and Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you'll never miss an episode of Coffee with Keith and Katie. Thanks again for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. This is Daniel Poppy, host of How to Write Good here on Public House Media. I just want to thank you for listening to the following broadcast brought to you by Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope that you'll come check out my show, How to Write Good, the writing show that is not about writing. A new show of How to Write Good comes up every Wednesday, so don't forget to subscribe on iTunes so you never miss an episode of How to Write Good. Again, thanks for checking out the following broadcast on Public House Media. 
my sweet summer's gone And on my mirror she made it clear Lipstick can't be wrong My summer, summer, my sweet summer is gone So in the last segment I brought up a man by the name of Clinton Barry Who in 2013 as we come back on the cheap seats by Public House Media Five years ago Barry was a September call-up to the Boston Red Sox on the way to a World Series championship. And because, Got a ring. because of his play in September, he played himself onto the postseason roster. So, so, so someone, But he was brought up. Yeah. Wasn't he acquired afterwards, so he wasn't postseason eligible? No, he was. He played the postseason. Okay. okay. His name is on the he postseason did. roster T-shirts. Yes, it was. He was not just acquired in September and he couldn't play. No, 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 no. <laughs> he played his way to the postseason. Don't ruin my story for me, Chris. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm trying to remember 2013 because uh, that was a very busy, busy October for yeah, me. That was, for, as a Red Sox fan, that was a very busy October. It was October. a long time ago. Yes, it was. So five years ago, this man played his way from the minor leagues to a September call-up to the MLB postseason and managed to win a championship with the Boston Red Sox. That man may never win another championship in baseball his entire life. Mm -hmm. I bring up his story mostly because there are players like him that have one, maybe two good skills. They're fast. They can field. They're a great defensive substitution. They're great against left-handed pitchers. They're fantastic against right-handed closers for whatever reason. They bring up these one or two tool players that have one shot to do anything at the major league level. This is their big chance. This is their payday. This is what they wait for their entire life to call themselves a major league baseball player, even if it is just for a month. This means the world to a lot of people in double A, triple A, any minor league team. This is their chance to show something. It's basically a confirmation that your entire life that you've planned for, that you've lived for, you've lived to play Major League Baseball. This is your moment. You may not get another one. I want to keep the September call-up rule. I really want to keep the 40-man roster, mostly because I want to give every one of these guys a chance. They have one shot. Even if they just play one game, somehow it's worth it. Okay, so that's all fine and good, but um, baseball, as much as it needs to care about its players and it needs to help and still figure out some stuff with regards to labor laws in baseball, it's it needs to refocus its energy on its fans. And the 40-man roster, the September call-ups, are, are not helping in that sense. Let me take you back to last year. Let me take you back to Labor Day of 2017, okay? Mike Sosha in a 11-9 victory for the Angels over the Oakland Athletics, played an 11-inning game, four hours and 48 minutes. Now, I, I, I'm trying to remember. I got to look back at this real quick. Hang on. Let me see here. Um, the Oakland Athletics and the Angels on Labor Day last year were completely and totally out of contention. So in a game that did not matter, yeah, because the, the Astros ran away with the West last year. I completely forgot that they were yeah, 21 games above the, the Angels yeah. last year. So because of that, these two teams are playing a meaningless game in September. But because of the 40-man roster, Mike Sosha uses a league record 12 pitchers in the 11-inning game. That's 11 pitching changes. Guys like Parker Bridwell, Blake Parker, Jesse Chavez, Jose Alvarez, Noe Ramirez, Cam Bedrosian. Who? Exactly. Troy Scribner. And the only reason I know Troy's name is because he and I work together. I, I, I cover the team that he played for in college. So, like, four hours and 48 minutes. And the only reason this was allowed to happen is because the roster expanded to 40 players. You cannot have that. This ruins, like, September becomes a pain and it becomes such a slow, terrible crawl for Major League Baseball. When you add 15 guys to the roster, the majority of whom are pitchers, you add pitching changes, you add those mound visits, 
and you add minutes to the game in a month of September where you are now competing with college football and the NFL for ratings. And I don't care how much the Red Sox are winning or how close you know, the National League wildcard may be. If I've got to see four pitching changes in one inning with two guys that I've never heard of or go watch Alabama blow the doors off Louisville, guess what I'm going to watch do? Watch Alabama kill Louisville. Exactly. It's not fun to watch on TV or even in-house anymore. I don't oppose expanding rosters. What I propose is doing it completely different. I was Monday, Labor Day, I was driving um, after my brother, my little brother's wedding in New York. I was driving back home to North Carolina, and I was listening to ESPN Radio when the Red Sox-Braves game was on. Jim Bowden had an interesting idea that I kind of like. Eliminate September call-ups. You can keep your 40-man roster, that's fine, where major league teams have 40 contracts. But instead of September call-ups, expand the major league roster to 28 players through the length of the season. Add three players. That way you can keep that you know, one or two extra arms in the bullpen. You can keep that sixth starter, quote-unquote. You could keep that third catcher or fourth catcher. You could keep that pinch runner on. But what this does, like I mentioned earlier, it takes away the 40-man roster, the September call-ups, takes away the competitive balance of these games that mean the most. Because what is the point of bringing in your lefty specialist when, if you're the Braves, what's the point of bringing in you know, your, your lefty specialist when you know that the Orioles or the Marlins are going to have five right-handed hitters that they could just throw in and pinch hit against and make it meaningless. The Marlins have no business competing, but your game is being completely changed. Your scouting reports are being completely altered because 15 different players potentially have been added to a roster of a team that does not matter in September. When you look at some of this last year, and, and these numbers, they're they're minuscule, I understand, in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. But when you look at it in terms of baseball, in September of 2017, after the calls, the average game, average pace of play for a nine-inning game was almost two minutes more than the rest of the season. That doesn't really mean much to people, but when baseball is already 10 minutes longer than it was two years ago, that becomes an issue. And again, it's not just the players. It's not just the pitching changes and the length of time of a game. But clubhouse managers trying to scramble to, to squeeze 13 extra guys in. Um, travel secretaries trying to figure out more travel for 13 other players. Scouts trying to figure out, again, everything else for guys just brought up from the minors. It really does put a strain on the game of baseball, not just from a pace of play, but from a competition standpoint. And I don't think you should be playing Major League Baseball for five months only to have the style of it and the pace of it change in the last month when things mean more than ever just because you can give that minor leaguer who's had a great year at double a the opportunity to play major league baseball i'd argue that your scouting reports just need to be better there's already too much information now you're going to add 12 guys that i have to i have to look up add someone who look at the minor leagues i mean they generally do but you know those guys it, it just becomes it, so now you're you're taking these sheets and you're turning them into like literally like like cheesecake factory menus like that's how long your scouting report is <laughs> oh my god you just brought a bad flashback to me the cheesecake factory menus yes. like seriously hey, hey. Like, look, I, i'm not i'm not against the like i said the 40 man but expand the actual thing to 28 i'll i'll even say 29 guys for the entire year what's wrong with that instead of september call ups you have 29 guys for the entire year you can still keep the 40 contracts so you can move guys around as need be but like it just slows down the game like i don't care about this single a double a. it's a great story but if i'm a of a team competing for a pennant like the cubs the brewers the phillies the diamondbacks if if the yankees you know the the athletics if i'm competing for that playoff spot i don't want a team like the orioles or the royals or the white Sox completely derailing my opportunity because they're bringing up guys that literally only their parents have heard of. Like it's, it takes away the competitive nature of baseball in the last month of the season when it should be the most competitive. 
I think I think fans need to refocus their attention. Like the the human side of baseball has been lost in the data shuffle. I I will agree with. But why? But why do I need to focus on that double A guy when I should be focused on Mookie Betts, Mike Trout, Bryce Harper, Javi Baez, Jose Ramirez, Jose Altuve, Carlos? Like we already do a poor enough job marketing the stars that are currently in the game. Why am I bringing up a double A guy just to add to it in September? Because that double A guy represents small town world where you finally get someone to achieve their dream. That's worth something. I'm not saying it isn't. I'm just saying when bring them up throughout the entire year. Let them be on the 28 man roster in April. Man, I'm not opposed to that idea at all. Like I'm really that's my I, argument. Like, I like, like, like expanding it just a little bit to give teams a little bit of wiggle room, give them some injury help. And even if you have exactly. to raise the luxury tax or the salary cap or whatever the heck the rule is now in baseball, you can do that. That's something you can factor in. I think I think your idea is a reasonable compromise between people who don't want to see the roster expand by 15 players in one month to say, all right, you can have three extra slots for a guy for the entire yeah, year you can have it now look, th- there are service time issues that you got to figure out like there's a reason why the nationals held juan soto out for the first three weeks of the year because now they keep control over him for another same year with ronald acuna jr uh, right ronald acuna jr same with uh chris bryan a couple of years ago with the cubs like i understand you got to change that stuff around bryce but, harper many years ago yes i i think it it just makes more sense to expand the roster a little for the length of the season than to expand it a lot for the most crucial part of the year. I'm I'm coming around to your opinion on this. That's what I like to hear, man. Yeah, I know. That's what I like to hear. I, I, I've initially thought that, you know, these are 15 people who are going to be making major league debuts, and, like, this is a huge... But they're not. The Red Sox are calling up Brandon Phillips. This is true, and Brandon Phillips, for people who have no idea... Um, he last played in the major leagues. Um, would, would you care to name the date or shall I? Was that when he like kicked somebody in the face? You know, I didn't even find that story. Oh, boy. Was that 2016? Was that when he was, was that when he got into a fight like up against the netting behind home plate? I think that was Red's Braves, if I remember correctly, when he was playing for Atlanta for whatever reason. Wow. Anyway. Okay. I did not even find that on his story. <laughs> Nobody wrote that. I gotta find it. Hang on. Oh, it was Cardinals Reds. It was 2010. Ah, that was a long time ago. It was That's eight why. years ago, though. <laughs> yes, it was. But again, he last played Major League Baseball a very long time ago. It feels like it did. I don't remember the last time he actually well, played. Last, pl- well, okay, last played as in like last played full majors, full time Major League Baseball. Yes. So this this really is an interesting case with him. How he? Well, okay. It was it was just last year. He played 120 games for the for the Braves last year. All right. Fine. 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 All right. I mean, but yeah, there do. there was enough of a gap where it's like the last time he won a big award of any sort was the 2013 Gold yeah. Glove and his All Star nomination. Yeah, the last time he like legitimately had that. So. So it's been a while for him, and it's good to see him back in a major league uniform and to get that major league payday. But again, he's already had one before. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not upset about it. Yeah, he's already had one. Like I'm looking at the 26 year old who's making a major league debut and thinking that guy is achieving his dream. That yeah, and, and don't get me wrong; those are great. Those I mean, look at look at 2016. The Colorado Rockies called up a guy named Stephen Cardulo. Who had been, who had washed out of the minor leagues six years prior, was playing in independent baseball, gets called up by the Rockies just before the September call ups, but on his 29th birthday in a doubleheader hits a grand slam in game one and another home run in game two of the doubleheader. Like those stories are great, but what do they do? What do they do for the actual competitive? And we forget about them once the calendar, once that, that team that calls up a guy who's been ter- once that terrible team calls up a guy for the story, we forget about it once that season ends. It's easy to forget a good story. Exactly. Bad stories stick, though. Yes, they do. All right. Like the Nationals this year. Speaking of bad stories, oh, I have an interesting stat for when we come back from the break. It's not my Wild Wednesday story, but it is very interesting, and it does have to do with the Nationals. 
I like it. It's called a tease, ladies yes. and gentlemen, by the way. Let's move to a break. Wild Wednesday is coming up next. We'll be right back on the Cheap Seats, powered by Squadcast. I'm the Greg. And I am Dave Show. We host the Greg and Dave Show on Public House Media. Thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out our show, The Greg and Dave Show, where we talk about strange, bizarre, and sometimes just downright quirky news stories that you may not have heard about. A new show comes out every Wednesday. Be sure to subscribe on iTunes. And hey, thanks for listening to the following broadcast on Public House Media. Hi, this is Baxter Colburn, host of the Verse of the Day podcast here on Public House Media. Once you're done with this episode, I hope you'll come check out my show, Verse of the Day, where we take a look at real-world experiences and applications to one Bible verse every Monday through Friday as we get an idea of what it looks like to be a little bit better of a Christian and how we can make this world a better place one verse at a time. I hope you'll join me every single Monday through Friday right here on Public House Media. I hope you'll subscribe by going to Apple Podcasts or wherever you find good podcasts as well. Once again, thanks for tuning in to the following broadcast here on Public House Media. Thank you again for sticking with us on this podcast, Max Christian. We're back on the Wednesday show now. Christian, I got a little uh, a little trivia for you. The Washington Nationals throughout okay. throughout the month of August were not very good. Now, I want to ask you something. Okay, how many times were they five hundred during the month of how, August? How many times do you think? Just give me give me a guess. Six. Well, you're a little low, actually. Okay. So they went 60 and 60, 61, 61, 62 and 62, 63, 64, 66, 67, 68, and 69 all even. The only time they missed was 65 and 65. So they're like, what, eight? Yeah, eight times. That's nuts. <laughs> actually, no, wait, that's nine. Nine. Yeah, because nine times. Because of 60 and 60. That's crazy. Jeez. And then they gave up, yeah. which they should have done three weeks earlier. But whatever. I, I love those little tiny nuggets like that where a Bryce Harper sacrifice fly in extra innings helps the Washington Nationals go 69 and 69. That's nice. just nuts. I, 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 can't, I don't understand that. <laughs> I, I think that meme deserves to die, but I think it's hilarious that in the 60 win, 60 loss category, the only time they weren't 500 was 65 and 65. That's wow. crazy. All right. Speaking of crazy, it's Wild Wednesday. We've got our stories for you. Uh, Christian, I'm going to let you go. What have you got this week? All right. So I, I I don't know if this is wild, but it's just kind of funny and weird to me. So 2012, do you remember uh, the Nike campaign that was Votto for president? Speaking of Joey Votto. For the Cincinnati I Reds. don't remember that this was a Nike campaign, but I do remember, I do remember that yeah. whole that whole thing with the Reds having that campaign. I don't remember this being Nike though. Yeah, so it was a Nike campaign uh, in 2012. T-shirts that had Votto for president, and apparently Joey Votto never had, never kept any of those shirts. Never kept them. So the other day uh, on on Labor Day. As he's playing first base, he sees a Reds fan sitting along the first base side in Pittsburgh wearing one of those T-shirts. Votto goes over to the guy and wants the T-shirt. He said, would you take a jersey? Would you trade me jersey for T-shirt? So, of course, what guy is going to sit there and say, yeah, of course I'll take a Joey Votto T-shirt or Joey Votto jersey, right? So this dude literally in the fourth inning takes his shirt off and hands it to Joey Votto. I love it. Votto then, uh, and there's actually a great picture of this dude bare-chested giving a fist bump to Joey Votto. It's amazing. Um, so then Votto literally goes over, grabs a different jersey, and gives it to this dude. Now, Joey Votto, for those of you who don't know, is Canadian, so therefore cannot be president. So what he instead wrote on the autographed jersey was, more like prime minister. 
Like I, <laughs> Joey Votto is a stud. I, I, Joey Votto is the I, man. I love it when athletes like that have especially a sense of humor about not only where they're from, but who they are and what they do. And they, they really get a sense of humor. I think Votto has that aura about him because he's such a hitting machine. He's a great yeah. baseball player. But sometimes the, the human portion of that story to not get your own giveaway shirt is a crime. That should not be allowed. It's hilarious. It's so funny to me that he never once, like he was, it, it would be like Jordan never getting a pair of Jumpmans. That's stupid. Why Why would that happen? Yeah, that's, that's the point. Exactly. That's what happened. <laughs> Votto never got one of his own t-shirts. It was so funny. All right. Now I've got something from low tier British soccer. Okay. In the sixth tier, so this is non-league. This is very much out of the way. Yeah. Two teams have been forced to cancel a game because one of the teams has an international player who is being called up. Now, you might be thinking, don't these leagues go on international break? You're right, but only down a certain level. You're thinking of the big leagues. You're thinking the Premier League. Like They take a break so right. their players can all go and play internationally. They're not expecting right. that to be an issue in the sixth tier. What country do you think they represent? The U.S. No, they, they don't represent the U.S. <laughs> no, they don't. But you're, That's as good as we can get. Sixth tier British You're football. in the right hemisphere, I will say. Oh, my goodness. Please tell me it's, it's Canada. It's not Canada. It's not a big country. I'll give you another. Oh, oh okay. But it, so it's like the northern hemisphere then? You're, no, you're in the, the western hemisphere. Oh, okay. The Western. So it's like, it's like Guyana or something like nope. that. Nope. Okay. One final hint. Haiti. Think islands. Curacao. St. Kitts and Nevis. What is that? Bless you. <laughs> All right. St. Kitts and Nevis have two international players playing for a non-league side, Nuneton Borough. They've had to cancel their game against York this upcoming Saturday because of their two players being called up to that national team. They can't just find two other players to fill. I in. guess not. <laughs> what is like, this is how, you know, your league's a joke. Like, like, Oh, I, I, two of my players had to go on vacation. I can't find two others to fill in for me. Like just go grab two drunks from the pub down the street and do it. I mean, they probably take a sign them to a one day. They take a great chance. It'd be a great promotional piece for your team. Like, Hey, we have a fan audition. You can play it. Open tryouts for us. Open tryouts. Do it. Be hilarious. So Theo Wharton and Harrison Paniotu are in the St. Kitts and Nevis Nation squad for their CONCACAF Nations qualifier against Puerto Rico this upcoming Saturday. And because they have to travel for that game, their regular league team, Newton Borough, had to cancel the Saturday game against York. Seriously, like, like this is a serious question. They don't have two substitutes. They don't have two guys that can sit on the that sit on the bench during every other. I game. mean, you know, they play all eleven every time. Well, uh, and guys in soccer, you play with men down before, like like a guy gets a red card, you play with a man down. Come on, yeah, but you don't want to start a game with nine guys. Not oh, forget that. I would start a guy with th- I would start a team with three just because, just to show. I off. mean, this it's wild about this story is that. Uh, down this fall, you're not expecting people to be representing national teams, but the national right. team is St. Kitts and Nevis, a small island nation of I'm forgetting how few people. It's yeah, that's wow, it's kind of crazy. Like, okay, and they don't have. I'm sorry, they don't have substitutes. Like, what is that? Now, it's a poor job by the GM. There, hang on, I'm trying to find their population. Okay, their population estimate from 2016. 54,821. There are colleges that have more kids than that. Uh, yes, you are correct. I go to one of them. Jeez, that's incredible. Like, there, are more people, <laughs> there are more people at Michigan football games every Saturday yeah. than there are in this island nation where two dudes who represent them have to leave their club and join something else. I don't know how you do it, but you always find it. I, I don't know. I how. always seem to find these strange stories, and I'll give you a hint. It's called Following BBC Sport. They have Fair enough. <laughs> stories on the internet. Love them. Fair enough. Good follow for people. Yep. 
All right. Christian, last words. What have you got? Absolutely nothing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, seriously, expand like but seriously, expand the roster for the entirety of the season, add three, maybe I'd be fine going to twenty nine. I think that'd be just fine for people. I don't think anybody would be upset about it. Um, and it would make the games more competitive throughout the year and it would give those minor leaguers an opportunity to play for the whole season. So do it. I will say congratulations to the WNBA finalists. Watch the WNBA people. Yes. Do it. It is a real league, and there's real competition in the finals. Someone please give the WNBA more press coverage than we do. We can't talk about it on this show because of the time that we record it, but don't worry about it. It is time for someone to watch the WNBA. Go Mystics! Yes. Do it. All right. That's, that's That's my little outburst for today. Thank you again for joining us on the Cheap Seats. I'm Max. Christian is with me. We'll be back again next week. We'll have another show for you for your downloads on Friday. Thank you again. Whole weekend of sports coming up. It is an underrated month, everybody. Football, basketball, hockey in the preseason, baseball. All of them are back this month. It is time to appreciate September sports. And that is it for today's episode. Thank you again for listening to us on the Cheap Seats presented by Squadcast. We can are available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, the Spreaker Studio, and more. Go to our Facebook page, The Cheap Seats on Public House Media. Should Major League Baseball allow more players on the rosters in September? We had two plans. We had two ideas. Take a vote. Which one do you like? We'll be back next week for you on The Cheap Seats. <laughs>